Thank you. So the uh, IOF will be dealt with in a, a series of sessions, all of its own tomorrow. I'm just going to provide an introduction here, uh, how the IOF came into existence and show you examples of the content that we've created. Um, so uh, as I think many of you know, that basic formal ontology started uh, in connection with the results of the Human Genome Project. Uh, these results were in the form of long and complicated genome sequences, which didn't make any sense to a biologist or a clinical researcher. And the gene ontology, which is still by far the most successful ontology in many respects, was created as a vehicle to tag genomic sequence data with terms derived from ordinary biology and medicine. And um, in order to extend the range of the gene ontology, we created a series of other biomedical ontologies, which were put together to form the foundry. And the idea behind the foundry was that all of the ontologies developed within it would be developed in coordination with the developers of the other ontologies within it, so that we have from the very beginning an interoperable collection of ontology. And um, this is where you find all the ontologies now and uh, the various software and other features of the ontologies which are being continuously tested. And this is the structure. So we have a top level hub and then we have domain specific spokes at various lower levels. And uh, all of the domain ontologies thereby can be seen as having their, as their starting point, the terms in the top level. And the top level is designed to be a rather small and very generic ontology. And uh, BFO is one top level ontology. Uh, Dolce is another top level ontology. So this is the picture as it looks with BFO at the top, the ontology for biomedical investigations in the middle, and then all of the various domain specific biomedical ontologies and the bottom block. This is BFO 2020, which is the latest version of BFO, which was created in connection with the ISO standards process, which I'll talk about in a minute. And uh, these are the material entity terms in BFO. These are the attribute terms in BFO. Uh, these are the process terms in BFO. And these are the information entity terms in BFO. So you can see that BFO is very small. It's designed to be small so that it can be easily taught and easily applied by many, many people in the same way. That's the goal. It's been uh, maintained over now 16 years by a group of people who are all of them uh, very argumentative. And so we think we've argued through at least the majority of the potential problems which the definitions of these terms might involve. And this has worked. So the OBO foundry is now not the only foundry using BFO. There are many others, um, some of them quite big and, and, uh, and quite uh, influential in their different domains. And the one I'm going to talk about today is the Industrial Ontologies Foundry, uh, which was started in 2016. We are now just about ready to release uh, the first suite of ontologies within the IOF. And I'm going to talk about the core IOF ontology. But first, um, I need to say a little bit more about the Common Core Ontology Suite, which you see at the top here. This was created uh, on the basis of an IARPA grant in the US um, to uh, solve problems of data analysis, get them free online if you press the right button. And uh, the first part is a statement of requirements for being a top level ontology. And these have to be requirements which can be verified. In other words, you can verify that an ontology satisfies the requirements. And I invite you to, uh, to look at them. They are, uh, I think, quite illuminating because the, the challenge was to specify a verifiable requirement for being an ontology, which is such that it could apply to every entity in the universe. 
And then part two is BFO, which basically shows that part uh, that the BFO 2020 satisfies the requirements set forth in part one. And that there will almost certainly be further parts. So Dolce and uh, Topper are two ontology efforts which are being uh, uh, considered at the moment for be, being parts three and four in this set of standards. So there are something like 500 domain ontologies extending BFO, and you can find the list there. Most of them are biology and medicine, but we have increasingly large numbers in relation to the other suites D uh, described earlier. But now we'll talk a little bit about the IOS. So uh, this is the, um, the general strategy. Um, so we have the IOF core, which I will conclude with, in a minute, and then we have some working groups which have um, ontologies which are based on the IOF core and which are already in a mature state. And these are the yellow uh, boxes here. And then we have various materials ontology efforts which are also in a mature state, but they do not form a harmonious whole because they were developed independently and they, there are overlaps problems. And there are other materials ontologies which we intend to use, uh, including the EMMO ontology, where we hope to be able to find a way of using some of their content uh, in such a way that it is compatible ontologically with the IF, IOF core and then with BFO. Now, uh, the problem with materials ontology is that the term material and materials terms like sugar or metal or water are used in two quite different senses. In one sense, they, they are referring to types of substance. And in another sense, they're referring to portions of material, for instance, uh, material which has been shaped uh, to be a wheel or a, a gear. And the problem is that developers of materials ontologies in the past have very often confused these two uses of the word, which are very different in all kinds of ways, and which both have instances and universals uh, on their uh, uh, respective sides of the uh, definitional picture. Um, okay, now quickly back to BFO 2020. These are the material entity terms. These are the material entity terms in the IOF core, which look like this. So we have material artifacts, assemblies, machines. Uh, we have agents. We have systems. We have maintainable items, material components, raw material, and so on. Uh, these are the attribute terms in BFO, which means qualities, roles, dispositions, and functions. And these are where they appear in the IOF core. And uh, these are the qualities, roles, disposition, functions, and, and we are now adding capability into the picture. Uh, and so you see function and capability over there on the right, um, agent role, and, um, and so forth. So, and, um, and then we move to process terms. These are the process rele relevant terms in BFO. And these are the occurrence parts of the um, IOF core. And so we have planned process, computing process, measurement process, manufacturing process, assembly process, and so on. And there you can see uh, that in a slightly larger font. And I believe, uh, well, no, I'm not quite done. So now we see information entity. These are the information entity types used in the IOF core. So uh, designs, directives, designations, location, identifications, and so on. And uh, that is where I, oh no, I don't stop here. I wanted to, uh, to mention, and I don't normally do this, but the book just appeared. And so it's very much uppermost in my mind. Uh, so we all want to make AI work to help us do our job in using ontologies to help people, for instance, in the manufacturing world. And AI really will work, but mostly it won't work. The, most of the claims people make on behalf of AI, uh, or let's say most of the more ambitious claims people make on behalf of AI, will not work. That's what this book is about. 
But the final chapter is about just the sorts of things that we're discussing uh, here, namely how AI will work in areas like industrial manufacturing. And so now that really is the end. Thank you very much.